Hello, I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is the sixth video I am doing in a series on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check those out before continuing with this one. By now we have established that God exists, and that if he is the God of any one religion, it is most likely Christianity. Now we're going to start examining the central claims of Christianity and see if they stand up to historical scrutiny. You may say that the resurrection of Jesus is the foundational belief of Christianity. While this is true on one level, it does presuppose a more fundamental belief, namely that Jesus existed. Most historians happily accept that Jesus existed, but you will encounter many laymen on the internet who deny this. The purpose of this video is to look at the historical evidence that Jesus existed. Naturally, the clearest attestations to Jesus' existence come from Christian sources, such as the Gospels. However, there are several non-Christian and even anti-Christian sources that also attest to Jesus' existence. First, let's look at the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He is generally considered to be reliable with a few caveats. He is very biased when talking about himself, and he often exaggerates some of the details, such as in some of the speeches he gives to the figures he describes. In terms of general events, however, he is very accurate, as shown in his account of the Jewish war against the Romans. One of his most well-known works is The Antiquities of the Jews, which attempts to give an exhaustive account of Jewish history from the creation of the world to his own time. In this work, he mentions Jesus twice. In Book 20, Chapter 9, he writes, quote, The high priest Ananias assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned." Unquote. There is nothing in this passage that indicates that this was a forgery, especially because it just says that Jesus was called Christ. This also clearly demonstrates that Jesus existed, as you can't be the brother of someone who doesn't exist. Although this is only a passing reference to Jesus, it clearly indicates him as a historical figure who really did live. Also, Josephus is writing about the year 93 AD, which is within a century of Jesus' death. Josephus mentions Jesus one other time in the Antiquities, in Book 18, Chapter 3. This is perhaps the most famous reference to Jesus outside of the New Testament, and it is called the Testimonium Flavianum. Josephus writes, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, he was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day." Unquote. This passage clearly corroborates many of the details about Jesus that we find in the New Testament. However, many scholars have questioned the authenticity of this passage because Josephus writes things that a first century Jew would not write about Jesus, such as calling him the Christ. At the same time, they do not believe that this passage is entirely a Christian forgery. The most common view among scholars is that there is an authentic core to this passage with some Christian interpolations. One reason why they think this way is because Josephus calls Jesus a wise man, something that a later Christian scribe would be unlikely to make up. Also, another possible translation of wonderful works is paradoxical deeds, another term that Christians would be unlikely to use about Jesus. We also have another manuscript tradition for this passage in Arabic, which reads like this, quote, At this time there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of the Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day." Unquote. This text is much more in line with what a Jew would have written about Jesus, and as such the original passage probably looks something like this and it still corroborates many details about his life, such as his crucifixion and supposed resurrection. Notice also the caveats I mentioned earlier about Josephus' reliability do not apply here. 
this is a very reliable extra-biblical source for Jesus' existence. Jesus is also mentioned in the writings of the Roman historian Tacitus, who wrote in the early 2nd century. Tacitus was one of the most reliable historians of antiquity. He almost never accepted his sources blindly, and usually makes the reader aware of his skepticism if there is any. Even when he used his own friend Pliny as a source, Tacitus still questioned him and even at one point called his testimony absurd. Quote, This is the statement of Pliny. For my own part, whatever his assertion may be worth, I was not inclined to suppress it, absurd as it may seem. Unquote. Thus, when he mentions Jesus and Christians in his annals, it is not something to be ignored. In Book 15 of the Annals, Tacitus writes, Quote, you were substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men, loathed for their vices, from the crowd styled Christians. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus, and this pernicious superstition was checked for a moment only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find a vogue." Unquote. Notice that Tacitus is not only non-Christian, but also anti-Christian, even going so far as to call Christianity a disease and a pernicious superstition. In other words, he thought Christianity was both evil and stupid, yet he still recognizes that its founder truly existed and even mentions who was ruling when Jesus was executed. If these Christians had been following the teachings of a man whom Tacitus believed never existed, he certainly would have mentioned that, but he doesn't. Nor does he question his source for Jesus' crucifixion. Even the anti-Christian Tacitus accepts that Jesus existed. Tacitus is not the only Roman historian to make reference to Jesus. Suetonius, another reliable Roman historian, also mentions Jesus in the Twelve Caesars, also written in the early 2nd century. When writing on the Roman Emperor Claudius, Suetonius states, quote, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from Rome." Unquote. Here we have a clear reference to a controversial Jewish leader named Crestus living in the first century. Crestus was a common Greek name at the time, and because it sounded very similar to Christus, the Greek word from which we get the word Christ, many people in the first century got the two mi names mixed up. Even many Christians referred to Jesus as Crestus. Because the name Crestus was almost always given to a Gentile, when it does refer to a Jew, it almost always refers to Jesus. Inference to the best explanation would tell us that Suetonius is referring to the same man that Tacitus and Josephus are referring to. Also, this corroborates the Book of Acts, which mentions Claudius' expulsion of the Jews. Pliny the Younger, a Roman governor and the man I mentioned earlier as being a friend of Tacitus, also mentioned Jesus in a letter he wrote to the Emperor Trajan in 106 AD about how to deal with Christians. Quote, they asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a god, and to bind themselves by oath, not to do some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, nor falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so." Unquote. Although this letter does not mention Jesus' historical existence directly, it does show how the early Christians viewed Jesus, namely as God. This letter also tells us in other places that early Christians were willing to undergo extreme persecution and even death for Jesus. Because all of the evidence we have suggests that early Christians did indeed view Jesus as a historical figure, we'll talk about that later, it would indeed be odd for Christians to undergo extreme persecution for Jesus if he hadn't existed. Especially those Christians who claim to know Jesus personally, like Peter and James. Why would they make up stories about a man that would only get them killed? How would their ideas have been able to spread at all? Surely someone would have squashed Christianity by merely pointing out that Jesus didn't exist. This brings me to another point. In the early centuries of the church, there were several pagans, such as Celsus and Porphyry, who wrote scathing critiques of Christianity. They ridiculed several Christian doctrines, such as the Incarnation and Resurrection, as ludicrous. But they never questioned Jesus' existence as a historical figure, only certain claims about Jesus. If Jesus truly had never existed, and early Christians just made him up, these critics would have loved to point that out. But they didn't. In fact, we have no records of any Christ myth or existing until the 18th century, 
How come critics of Christianity who lived much closer to the time period of Jesus' life never claim that he didn't exist? It's probably because he did. And these are only the non-Christian sources. When we look at the early Christian sources, we find even more evidence. Some might object that the Christian sources are biased and we shouldn't trust them. However, every author is biased, and just because an author is biased doesn't mean that he is untrustworthy, especially if we're talking about something as basic as the existence of someone. Many people had biased opinions about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but that shouldn't give anyone reasons to doubt his existence. The same is true of Jesus. First, let's look at extra-biblical Christian sources. The earliest Christian writings not found in the Bible are from men known as the Apostolic Fathers. One of the most important of these fathers is St. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries and was well acquainted with the Apostles. For example, he was most likely ordained bishop by St. Peter himself. In his letter to the Trillians, Ignatius makes explicit reference to the historical existence of Jesus. Quote, Stop your ears, therefore, when anyone speaks to you at variance with Jesus Christ, who was descended from David and was also of Mary, who was truly born and ate and drank. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate. He was truly crucified and truly died in the sight of beings in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead, his father quickening him, even as after the same manner his father will so raise up us who believe in him by Christ Jesus apart from whom we do not possess the true life." Unquote. We also find references to Jesus' existence in the writings of St. Justin Martyr. Quote, Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, who was also born for this purpose, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the times of Tiberius Caesar, and that we reasonably worship him, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third, we will prove. Finally, the earliest records we have of Jesus' existence are found in the New Testament, in the letters of St. Paul. Paul, because he knew many of the apostles personally, is an incredibly reliable and early source for the existence of Jesus. He opens his letter to the Romans, which no one disputes is authentic, by saying, quote, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and designated the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead." Unquote. Note that Paul said Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh. Paul clearly believed that Jesus was a historical person. There are two other passages from Paul's letters that I want to cite both from his first letter to the Corinthians, which again, no one denies is authentic. The first is a reference to the Last Supper and the Eucharist. Quote, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the chalice after supper, saying, This chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me." Unquote. Paul clearly states that Jesus had physical body and blood, and literally ate and drank with people. It's hard to do that if you don't exist. The second passage is a reference to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Quote, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Unquote. Again, Paul speaks of Jesus as dying and rising again, meaning he clearly thinks of Jesus as someone who actually existed. Even if you don't believe in the resurrection, you have to admit that this is remarkably early attestation to Jesus' existence, as these letters were written within 30 years of Jesus' death. So, let's look at all of these sources. Jesus is mentioned in the writings of Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr, and St. Paul, plus several other authors that I haven't mentioned. All of these authors were writing within a century of Jesus' death. Two of these authors we've seen in this video knew the apostles personally. What I ask you is the more probable explanation for all of this. That the earliest Christians just made Jesus up, even though it got many of them killed, and no one was able to question his existence for another 1700 years? Or that there really was a first century Jewish rabbi named Jesus, 
who attracted a large following, was so controversial that he was crucified, that his disciples claimed to see him alive again later, and preached him to the nations as the Jewish Messiah, as these texts all indicate. It is for this reason that the vast majority of historians accept the fact that Jesus existed. In fact, Jesus' mythicists are taken about as seriously as Holocaust deniers. That is all for this video. In the next video, I will be looking at the authenticity of the Gospels. I hope to see you all then. Thank you and God bless.